Brothers and sisters, we're continuing our expository study, going verse by verse through the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 5, and uh, we're going to pick it up in verse 17. By way of review, you'll remember that Peter and John had been arrested at the hands of the Jewish religious leaders who commanded them to no longer speak in Jesus' name. They boldly refused to obey that command, but rather they chose to be obedient to God and to continue to proclaim the name of Jesus and the truth of his gospel. Last week's section ended with the mention of many signs and wonders being done at the hands of the apostles, and we saw that this new church movement was continuing to grow. So we'll pick it up in verse 17. And it says, Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and that'll be important to remember the, uh, the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. In chapter 4, we saw the first arrest after the birth of the church. Now here in chapter 5, we see the apostles once again in trouble and being arrested. The antagonists in this instance are really the Sadducees, who were very much the party who was in power at this time, so to speak. The high priest was a Sadducee, and they were definitely... Uh, the Sadducees were definitely more liberal in their theology, uh, in that they rejected the belief in the resurrection from the dead, and they didn't really believe in miraculous supernatural stuff too much. Uh, they had an issue with that, and they really had a problem with the resurrection. That was one of the big differences between, uh, say, the Pharisees, who were the more conservative uh, religious group, and the Sadducees were the more liberal, uh, theologically liberal group that you know, really had a hard time with the supernatural stuff. In particular, the resurrection didn't really take the scriptures literally in that regard. And you see these kinds of groups, um, they've been around for a long time, but it's important to us, it's important for us to understand that their bad theology caused them to take issue with the apostles and the church on a very fundamental, almost worldview type of level. Now, here these guys are supposed to be the theological authority, and they're confronted with these, these loudmouth fishermen from Galilee who are proclaiming the resurrection from the dead and healing people in the name of some martyr that they just crucified, and the miracles they are performing cannot be denied. It's like a nightmare scenario for the Sadducees a whole movement founded on the resurrection and confirmed by signs and wonders, which cannot be denied. So this, this is why the Sadducees are really taking issue with, with Peter and John and these early uh, church disciples. Um, this, this growing movement called the church essentially said all the core tenets that the Sadducees believed were false. Okay, So that is the predicament the Sadducees were facing. The apostles continue preaching Christ, and the numbers are growing uh, big time, along with the miracles, and the Sadducees are not happy about it, and they have them arrested again. So they have them arrested, and then an angel of the Lord opens the prison doors and frees them, and then instructs the disciples to go and do the exact thing that they were just arrested for. So let's see what happens going from there. It says, But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent them to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we have found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priests heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. It's like, this is some priceless stuff. God has to have a sense of humor about some things. These guys have them arrested 
because they continue to preach in Jesus' name, which they commanded them not to do. They continue to talk about the resurrection. They continue to evangelize and do all the things that the Sadducees and the, and the chief priests are telling them not to do. They lock them up in prison. An angel of the Lord delivers them out of the prison and then instructs them to go do the very thing they're being arrested for, which flies in the face of everything the Sadducees believes. It is like they're spitting in their eye, um, essentially. And it is really putting the Sadducees in a bad position. And uh, and it's it's absolutely glorious the way that the Lord is working all this out. Verse 26, it says, Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, it says, for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. Now, um, this is really interesting. The disciples in the early church, they're actually growing in popularity. Uh, people are listening to their teaching. They're seeing the signs and, and miracles that are being done. Um, they're, they're coming. There's excitement. Thousands are being added to their numbers, and uh, and and the Sadducees are sort of losing some influence with the people here as the disciples gain influence, and so they can't just go out into the temple or into the the courts there and arrest them with violence and 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 you know just tie these guys up and drag them out. It says for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. Now it's like the shoes on the other foot. If they were to just come in and antagonize the disciples and by force pull them out, the people who have been healed by them and listened to their teachings, they might stone the Sadducees for trying to do that. And so in verse 7, 27, it says, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? Now, they're used to people listening to them. They were the guys that were in charge. You absolutely listened to the Sadducees and the chief priests because they could have you arrested or crucified or what have you. They're not used to people not listening to them. And so they said, didn't we strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. It said you filled Jerusalem with this doctrine. Actually, all of what they said was true in this instance. They were indeed filling Jerusalem with the doctrine of Jesus Christ and blaming the bloodshed of Christ on those responsible for his sentencing, which would have been them. Now, they clearly want to do the same thing to the apostles as they did to Jesus. Arrest him, have some kind of sham trial, and then probably crucify them. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. They didn't mince words, did they? They didn't back down. They didn't go, oh, well, this might be offensive to say to them. No, they boldly proclaimed the truth of Jesus Christ and what had happened. In verse 31, they say of, of Jesus, him, God has exalted to his right hand to be the prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. All of the key tenets of the gospel message seem to just pour out of Peter as he speaks. He is a different man than who he was prior to Acts chapter 2 and, and prior to the resurrection. It's truly amazing to see the insight just in these few short verses, uh, the insight that we can gain. I want you to notice in verse 31 that Jesus, the Prince, the Savior, gives repentance and forgiveness of sins. There are things that are granted by Jesus. Of course, we know only God can truly forgive and pardon sins and that it is because of the cross of Christ that this is possible. But did you also realize that he gives repentance, that the ability to repent is something that is given by God when we are empowered to change. It is the work of God's spirit in our lives. I, I found that interesting that he gives repentance. I believe it means he grants us the ability to repent. When you think about it, um, who convicts us to bring us to repentance? Well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He brings convic uh, conviction. Uh, Jesus told us that, that when the Spirit comes, he, he will convict us. Um, and so it, it's, it's, one of the, it's actually one of the key uh, proofs of salvation is the work of this work of repentance in our lives, the work of the Holy Spirit, the evidence that the Spirit of God truly lives 
within you. And that is something that's emphasized and pointed to over and over again in the scriptures. Repentance is a gift from God. Salvation is a gift from God. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Sanctification, the setting apart, that's what that means, that work of holiness and transfer, transformation that occurs in our lives is impossible without God's intervention. He grants us the ability by his spirit through the strength that he provides to repent. Repent is not, to repent is not simply to ask God for forgiveness. It's, it's a 180. It's a changing of the mind. It's a changing of the lifestyle that happens in the life of a believer, someone who receives God's spirit. Everything changes. And Peter also emphasizes the role and importance of the Holy Spirit who is given to those who obey Christ. This is just such a big doctrine in truth. Uh, when we talk about salvation, the three tenses of salvation, I have been saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. We talk about um, justification, which is accomplished through the cross, that Jesus paid the price for my sins. And we'll often look back and say, maybe I was saved on what, this period of time when I accepted Christ and believed the gospel message. I was justified at that time, positionally made right. The rest of your life after that is sanctification. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's God changing you, transforming you, conforming you more and more to the image of Jesus Christ. It is the work of God's Spirit in your life. It's why he's put his Holy Spirit in you as a seal of the greater inheritance. It is God's work in your life, his sanctification from now until eternity. That is what God's doing, and it's, it's an awesome thing. He's bringing you into greater and greater freedom through repentance, which is granted by him through the work of his Holy Spirit. Awesome theology. Peter just, it's just falls right out of his mouth as he begins to speak, and it's amazing and accurate. Verse 33, Sadducees don't like it much. It says, when they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. Side note, this highly respected Pharisee named Gamaliel was likely the same one who taught and trained the apostle Paul to be a Pharisee before his conversion to Christ. Now we're going to get into that in the book of Acts, Paul's conversion from Saul to Paul and all of that. But Gamaliel um, was likely his teacher and a prominent guy uh, at that time, a Pharisee. Acts 22 verse 3 says, uh, Paul speaking, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia and brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you all are today. So that was likely the same Gamaliel. Verse 35, here's what Gamaliel sa says. And he said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theotis rose up claiming to be someone, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. And after this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the sentence, census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan uh, or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to, fought, to fight against God. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beat them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Um, I'd like to point out, just in passing, first of all, this is just excellent practical wisdom from this Gamaliel. Okay, who basically says, look, if this is of the Lord and you guys are coming against it, you don't want to be found fighting against God. You'll never win that battle. That's true. Um, and they said, if it's not, and, and you know, they're all leaning towards, we think these guys are wrong. These, this early church is this blasphemous and so on. It'll come to nothing. It'll, it'll just dissipate in a number of months or in a year. These guys will be gone. Um, 
Just let them do their thing, basically. And if it's not of God, it'll come to nothing. And if it is of God, we don't want to be found fighting against them. A lot of wisdom. You also think, I also think there's some, there's some doubt there in Gamaliel's voice as to um, maybe his own convictions and his own beliefs. Notice also that <laughs> they called the apostles and they were going to send them out. They again command them not to speak in Jesus' name. But it also says that they beat them just in passing, you know. Um, and that always strikes me. And they, they called them in there and for the apostles. And they, after they had beaten them, they commanded them not to speak in Jesus. And so we don't really have to worry about that too much right now in America. But in other places in the world, they do. And throughout Christian history, this has been an issue. Persecution follows those who follow Christ. And it's just an important thing for us to keep in the back of our mind. Practical wisdom coming from Gamaliel here. I'd also like to point, it doesn't sound like, it, it sounds to me like he may have doubts. It's interesting that we do have records of Pharisees coming to faith in Christ. Um, Gamaliel was a Pharisee. Uh, Nicodemus in John 3 was a Pharisee. The Apostle Paul was a, was a Pharisee before he became Paul. And it also seems here that Gamaliel had his doubts but well, we have no record of a Sadducee coming to faith in Christ. Why is that? Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't, there were no Sadducees that came to faith in Christ. I'm sure somewhere along the line it happened, but we don't have any records of that, biblical evidence of that. It is interesting. And perhaps their liberal theology was so far away from the reality of God's truth. There's just a bigger chasm there they would have had to throw away all of their core uh, beliefs to come to faith in Christ. See, a Pharisee understood the law. They understood God's law. They took the scriptures at face value. They believed the God of the Old Testament was who he said he was and did what he said he did. But they had to overcome things like pride, their own self-righteousness, legalism. And, and really, they just had to accept that Christ was their long-awaited Messiah. Um, they had some misinterpretations of scripture, sure, but everything else they had, essentially they had the same worldview as the early church did. And at least we know that that's possible for them to come in faith, but the Sadducees would have had to completely abandon everything that they believed about faith and God. And that's, uh, the product of their liberal theology, uh, where there are no absolutes and you can't, uh, really take God at his word. And this is important because there are movements in the church today. There are movements that want to deconstruct Christianity, and there are progressive Christianity movements. And there's loads of liberal theology that is infiltrating and infecting churches today. And this is a really, really big deal. It's something we need to strongly consider and know why we believe uh, what we believe. We take a fundamental approach to scriptures. This is something that is really important to us and even to the identity of our church is we take God at his word. We take it seriously. We view the Bible as authoritative and as the very word of God, which he has supernaturally preserved down through the ages for us to have, to know who he is and to be instructed in the truth. Many people don't have that. And as soon as you undermine the authority of the scripture in any way, you begin to lose key fundamental pieces about the character of God, and even the gospel message. There can, it can start with just a failure to acknowledge God as creator. All sorts of different things, heresies, will I, can I say, will begin to creep in as soon as you undermine the authority of the word of God. And now you concoct a view of God that is corrupted and inaccurate, and anything goes. Anything can happen from there. And so what's going on with the Sadducees is not so different from many movements in the church today. It's nothing new. But always remember, it is the same tactic used by the devil in the garden back in Genesis. The undermining of the truth and the authority of God and his word. What did the serpent say to Eve in the garden? Did God really say? Has God indeed said, if you eat of this tree? dot, 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 or fill in the blank. And that's all you really need to see today is for somebody to say, well, what God really meant when he said this very plain as day, clear thing that you can read in scripture, 
is something other than what it says. Well, you know right off the bat that that's false. Anybody that's willing to take liberties with the word of God, any time that you need someone to, to stand in between you and God, well, that's a recipe for a cult. If you need some guru to explain to you what the scriptures mean, other than God by his spirit, or somebody coming along and saying, let's look at the scriptures together, you have some serious problems there. It's all of our responsibility as individuals to know the scriptures, to study the scriptures, when we hear a teacher, when we hear a pastor or whoever, to hold up what they're saying and, li and line it up with the scriptures. Does it line up? Does it not line up? The scriptures have to be the authority. If we don't have that, it, it's anything goes. It's circus sideshow. It's crazy, weird, nut job theology that just goes all over the place. And, and we want to avoid that at all costs because it's going to undermine the character of God and it's going to undermine the gospel message. Timothy warns us about this. The scripture warns us about this all over the place. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. The devil himself used scripture when he tempted Christ. He misused it. He took it out of context and twisted it uh, to try and manipulate Jesus. He used it in a way that, that it, it was an improper interpretation that conflicted with other scriptures. But Jesus knew how to fight back with more scripture and proper interpretation in the power of the Spirit, I might add. 2 Corinthians 11.13 says, for, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. The devil doesn't show up with, with a red suit on and a pitchfork and a tail. He shows up in the church. The church has never suffered damage from the outside attacking. It suffers damage from within. It's, it's the wolf in sheep's clothing that comes in. It, it's the minister who isn't truly a minister of the Lord that comes in. It's the corrupt doctrine and theology that creeps into the church that corrupts it and that does damage. Never from the outside. Remember, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So what we need to be on guard is these false doctrines, these teachings that, that are for itching ears that, um, that would do nothing but justify the sinful desires that are in our hearts. We have to say no to those things and continue to put that to death and pursue the truth of the gospel and the truth of God's word. And I think this is really our fight now. There are false teachings, false prophets, false gospels being presented, and it's our responsibility to stand on the word of God and proclaim the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And remember, when Peter made that great confession of faith, when Jesus asked him, who did, who did the people say that I am? And, and, um, and Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he said that on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If God is for us in that pursuit, then who can be against us? Well, we are the same church today with the same spirit within us who was within the early church and the apostles. And let's be like the Bereans that we read about in the book of Acts and just and, and hold up everything in the light of the scripture. Let the Bible be your ultimate authority by which you determine the truth. Um, we haven't gotten this far in the book of Acts yet, but in chapter 17, verse 11, it says of the Bereans, it says these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness, okay? I'm ready to hear. If you have something to share from the scriptures, I'm ready to hear it. It says, and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So I will listen to you if you want to talk about the Bible, but I'm going to search the scriptures for myself to determine if what you're telling me is the truth which is an excellent reminder of what our hearts and attitudes should be anytime we listen to a message, 
hear a podcast, listen to a sermon on YouTube, whatever, or read a Christian book. Let's be ready to receive, but then also searching the scriptures to verify that it really is the truth. And finally, chapter 5 closes with these verses after the council sides with Gamaliel. Verse 41, so they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And I think we should pray that God would do a similar work in our own lives and in our own church fellowships. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this section of scripture. Thank you, God, for giving us your word that we might know who you are and how you want us to live, Lord. I pray that you continue to teach us from it. Um, help us to revere you. Help us to revere your word, Lord, that you've preserved for us. Fill us with your spirit, God, uh, to embody your character, Lord, and to live changed and transformed lives by your grace and by your spirit. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.